All right, guys, if you can believe it, we are on our last section of taxonomy. So today we're going to be talking about our Haplorhynes, right? So we are moving into our old world monkeys, and we know the difference between those Catarhynes and those Platyrhynes. So these guys are our Catarhynes. Um, again, if we go back to those slides with the noses, we know the difference between the Catarhynes and the Platyrhynes. And this is all going back to our taxonomy chart, just so we know where everybody is sitting. So we're in our Haplorhyne, we're in our old world monkeys and apes, which are also in our Catarhyne category. Now, when we talk about the old world, we're talking about everything that you see here on the map in red. That's Africa and Asia and Southeast Asia. So as we remember, we do have some trends in our Catarhyne. Again, that's that nose, that's that small, narrow septum with those nostrils pointing down. Um, in our Catarhyne, we have both arboreal and terrestrial. None of our Catarhyne are nocturnal, so they're all going to be active during the day. They're all going to carry their infants ventrally or on their front. And we're going to see infant care by males very rarely. Well, we always point out any outliers in that. So let's take a look at two of our bigger group, or our bigger group, with is, which is our Circlopithecoideae. I know that one's a tongue twister. Circlopithecoideae. And again, that's going to break down into two, two smaller groups, your Circlopithecinae and your Calibinae. Circlopithecinae, Calibinae. Okay, so what's the difference? Let's look at our Circlopithecinae. Our Circlopithecinae are called, quote, cheek pouch monkeys because they have these things called buccal pouches. So you and I actually have cheek pouches. If we're, we sort of puff out the air on our cheeks, we have like a pouch area or um, an area between our cheek and our gums. So our cheek pouch, pouch monkeys. So our Circlopithecinae do have cheek pouches. Our Calibinae do not. Um, our circlopithecine are going to have a diet that's fruit and other, so meaning like mostly fruit and um, animals. So insects, small mammals, things like that. They're going to be medium to large in body size. They're going to have shorter tails or almost no tails at all. In our circlopithecine, we're going to have a natal coat that is the same as adults or drab. Uh, we're going to see our highest density of population in Africa. And our temperament is that they're going to be very active and socially dynamic. Our Calibinae, our leaf-eating monkeys, and there are Colobus and Langers. They do not have a buccal pouch. Their diet is mostly leaves. Um, and it says, and other, so they will eat some other things like flowers and tender shoots and stuff like that. But the vast majority of their diet is going to be leaves. They are large to very large. They have longish tails. So because they are mostly still arboreal, obviously if they're eating leaves, those tails do come in handy to help navigate the trees. They sort of act as rudders. Um, their natal coat. So the infants are born with a strikingly different coat color. So they may have a bright white coat, a bright orange coat in comparison to the adults. They are very, very bright and obvious as infants. A striking, strikingly different or markedly different coat color from the adults. Our Calibinae are going to be mostly focused in Asia. They're highest, um, the continent of highest density population. Um, and their activity level, they're going to be couch potatoes. So that would make sense. They don't have a very high nutrient diet. They're eating a lot of leaves, so they're not going to be very quick or active. One thing to note um, in our colobus is that they're going to be really broadly different coat colors across the species. So think about our marmosets and tamarins. Um, so that's because multiple species of colobus may live together and it helps them um, differentiate from each other. Okay, here are a few examples of our circopithecines. So we have a gelata baboon. So our, all of our baboons are going to fall into the circopithecines. So our gelata baboon is sometimes referred to as the bleeding heart monkey. You can't quite see it in this picture, but if we were to sort of pan out, 
that red mark on his chest would actually look like an upside down heart shape. Um, so he's our gelata baboon. We have our hamadryas baboon. And then we have all of our macaques. So there's several species of macaques. This one is our little Japanese macaque. I am going to drop a video in here of a, a very sweet documentary about a little Japanese macaque named Hiro that I definitely suggest you guys watch. So the Japanese macaques are interesting in that they do have the most northern habitat for any primate other than humans. They live very high in the northern mountains of Japan. So they are sometimes referred to as snow monkeys. So our Cercopithecines are pretty prolific. They live in a really large swath geographically and it makes them very, very interesting. So another note, this is a Celebes macaque, sometimes referred to as the Sulwazy black crested macaque. Um, again, macaques are found um, all through Asia and Africa, and they are probably the most prolific, meaning they live in the most, the widest region of any primate besides human. Um, and there's several different subspecies. These ones again are the Celebes or Sulwazy black crested. Our Circlopithecines are female bonded. So that means that our females are dominant. Whenever we say that a female society or a society is female dominant, that means those females live in the same natal group their entire lives. And that males, when they reach maturity, will emigrate or leave that group. And leaving that group prevents them from inbreeding. And they will actually transition from groups every few years as their daughters come into the age of maturity, again, to prevent the possibility for inbreeding. But you can see these guys have almost no tail. Um, their front limbs and hind limbs are pretty equal in length. They walk on all fours. They're quadrupeds. Um, again, they can walk on two legs if they need to carry something. Um, and they do carry their infants on their front, as you can see from this little guy right here. Here we have two examples of our colobines. Um, here we have a black and white colobus. You can see that beautiful white mantle of fur. These guys do live in Africa. They're arboreal, so they're going to live in the trees. Um, and often these guys are hunted for their pelts. In traditional African, especially ceremonial garb, you may see um, this pelt being used. Um, this little infant doesn't have that straggedly different coat color because he's probably developed the black. But when he was born, he was probably mostly all white. So he was very obvious in terms of his appearance, that he was a baby. Um, and that would make sense because these guys live up in the trees. So it's easier for the group as a whole to protect babies if they can see them very quickly and easily through all of those um, leaves. And then next to him, you have our stub dose langer. He's gonna live in Asia. Um, our langers are gonna be sort of all across Southeast Asia and Central Asia into India and they can be very different in terms of their you know facial structures but this guy's our little snub nose langer and again both of these guys are going to eat leaves um, a really interesting morphological adaptation so again think about that I'm telling you an interesting morphological or physical adaptation for these guys something that makes them unique probably something you want to take note of our our colobines have what we refer to as ruminant stomachs. They're chambered and ruminant. Can anybody think of another animal, one that lives locally, that might have a chambered and ruminant stomach? If you guys didn't think of it, it's a cow. So cows eat mostly grass, right? So they need to digest as much of that as possible. So unlike some of our other primates, our um, strepsorhinies that might re-eat their poop or practice um, uh, coprophagy or cecotrophy, these guys don't do that. They don't eat their poop. Um, you know, howlers are really, really lazy. They also don't eat their poop, but these guys are able to get extra nutrients out of those leaves that they're able to eat. And they're actually really able to eat some toxic leaves because of the nature of their stomachs. So they have these stomachs that have multiple chambers and that have different, they're ruminating. So they have um, like more intense stomach um, digestive um, enzymes in there that help them to break down as much of that fibrous low energy food as possible. Here's another example of our 
um, columbines. So we saw a snub nose langur. This here is the opposite. He is a proboscis monkey. So you can see he's got that big, big, long, bulbous nose. Um, so yeah, and he's got those long tails. So these guys are up in the trees. They're eating leaves. And again, they're going to look very different from each other. And again, here's a great photo of one of those black and white colobus. You do see him on the ground, but that's going to be very, very rare. They're going to spend the vast majority of their times up in the tree. Um, they're going to eat a lot of leaves. And yeah, he's just, <laughs> he's really cute. Um, again, he's going to be hunted for that beautiful pelt with that white mantle. And then when we get into some of our chimpanzee videos down the road and their behavior, you're going to see that these guys are also actually hunted by chimpanzees. They're one of the main prey animals of chimpanzees. Um, but again, even though you do see him on the ground, he's going to spend 90 to 99% of his time up in those trees because he is a leaf eater. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our hominoidea. So remember, when we talk about hominoidea or hominoids, right? So that's not just humans. So we have our hominoidea, which is our, which are our apes. So we have two categories of apes. We have our hylobates, and we have our um, hominid. Um, our hylobates are what we're going to call our lesser apes. Our uh, hominidae, <laughs> it's a tough one to say, are our great apes. So that's going to include our gorillas, orangs, chimpanzees, and humans. So if you see a question asking about a hominoid, or a hominidae, don't just assume it's humans. All of our great apes fall into that same category. Okay, so make sure you're looking on your taxonomy sheet um, and following everybody who falls under a category if I ask about it. Okay, so let's talk about our hylobates first, or our lesser apes. Those are our gibbons and siamangs, and we're gonna see a picture of them soon. Um, but they're gonna be a little bit smaller than our great apes, again, for us, in terms of other primates, you're going to think of them as large, but they're going to be really small compared to the great apes. Um, they're going to live mostly in Southeast Asia. Okay, that's going to be their distribution. Um, and they do sort of go outside of the trend. They are socially monogamous. So they tend to live in um, one male, one female groups with their um, immediate offspring. And then if we talk about our hominoids, uh, our great apes, we have our orangutans, which are going to live in Borneo and Sumatra. So those are two island nations. They're considered huge. They're very big. Um, they are considered solitary. So when we get into like ecological distribution and social grouping, we're going to see that that solitary for the orangutan isn't quite right. But for the most part, if you were to be walking around the forest, you would typically see them alone. Um, we have our gorillas. So there is two subspecies of gorillas. There's our lowland gorilla um, in West Central Africa, and then our mountain gorilla up in the volcanic mountains of Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. And again, huge. You know, you guys have seen these guys at the Buffalo Zoo probably. Grouping-wise, socially, it's usually one alpha male with many... Um, breeding females. Um, chimpanzees. Everybody knows what a chimpanzee is, I think. They live in the tropical rainforests of um, east, west, west, and north central Africa, and they're considered huge. And the, like our spider monkeys, they live in those large fission and fusion communities, male dominant. So those males will still stay in those natal groups. The females will emigrate into a new group and they have many members and those groups will fission and fusion throughout the day as they're foraging. Finally, we have our bonobos or bonobos. Um, they are a very, very close cousin to the chimpanzees. So if you guys have never heard of them, um, I'm not surprised. Um, they're a little bit lesser known, but we'll have some photos of them. We'll definitely talk about them in behavior. Um, these guys are in a much smaller geographical region, sort of in that big bend of the Congo River. Again, considered huge. And again, live in large fish and fusion communities, except for in bonobos or bonobos, it's female dominant. And then finally, we have the human. Um, we are distributed globally. We're the most prolific of all the primates. We are considered huge. Um, we live in large multi-male, multi-female communities. Um, in general, but we also have 
every type of social structure that you can think of depending on where you are culturally. This distribution map is pretty much just referring to our non-human apes. Um, the non-human apes are going to be limited to Africa um, and Southeast Asia. Let's start with our gibbons and siamangs. These are our hylobates, our lesser apes. So we talked about um, brachiation. We talked about how our spider monkeys were the only true brachiators in the new world. And these guys are our true brachiators in the old world. You can see those big, long arms um, with those big, long fingers that are able to go over those branches. These guys are like acrobats. If you've ever been to Disney's Animal Kingdom, they have a really beautiful exhibit um, of these brachiators and they just really can swing arm over arm. Um, and their legs, especially in our little Siamang, they just look disproportionately tiny compared to their arms. So again, in terms of behavior and um, social society and all of that, these guys are pretty similar. So I'm going to take them as a group. But physically, you can see a little bit of a difference. The gibbons are a little bit more slendered. The siamang here, he looks like he's obviously been lifting some weights. He's got these huge delts. So they're a little bit beefier. But again, in terms of behavioral and um, like dietary patterns and all that stuff, these guys are pretty similar. So I'm going to kind of take them as one single group. So you guys, we talked about the... Um, howler monkeys having those throat sacs. The um, gibbons and siamangs also have huge throat sacs. So these guys are beautiful vocal duetters. Okay. So every morning they wake up with their partner and they sing very loudly to you and I. It wouldn't sound like singing. It would sound like a lot of noise. But again, they're going to duet every single morning. And what that does is it helps establish their territory. Okay, so these guys do not want to come in contact with each other because if they come in contact, they may have to fight over territory or mates. So they use that big throat sac and those vocal duets to make sure they're maintaining distance from the next neighbors. So those vocal duettings are really, really important um, for them to maintain territoriality. And as I mentioned, these guys live in monogamous pairs. So typically what we'll see is one adult male and one adult female. They're a breeding pair. They will live together. Um, typically they will have their offspring with them. So their dependent offspring will be also be foraging with them. Sometimes they might see a juvenile or a little bit older offspring stay at the nest. Um, like our mar marmosets or tamarins, they may stay behind and suppress their reproduction for a short period of time. Um, and they will help raise their brothers and sisters. And this will help them down the road because mom and dad will usually help them establish a territory if they stay behind and help, um, at least for a little bit of time. So typically what we'll see is, again, a monogamous pair and usually at least one dependent offspring. Now we're getting into our great apes. So we have our orangutan and he is our only great ape, our hominid to... Uh, hominoid to live in Asia. So he lives on the islands of um, Borneo and Sumatra and he is our Asian great ape. Um, orangutan literally translates into man of the forest. He's also our only truly arboreal great ape. So even though orangutans are big, a male orangutan could be upwards of 500 pounds. They spend almost all of their time up in the trees. So they do eat a lot of leaves, okay? So we actually have here, we have a female on the left and a male on the right. So in this picture, you can't see his whole face, but you see how he's got these large, like sort of flattened, flattened cheek pouch or cheek patches on either side. So males will have these very large, flat, robust, like hairless cheek patches on either side. Um, and that means he's an adult, fully breeding male. Okay. So that's sexual dimorphism. So in this species, we really do start to see sexual dimorphism and sexual dimorphism means that there's difference in the physical size of the animal based on gender. Okay. So a female is going to be smaller than a male and can be visually very clearly smaller. So we have very large males with very big cheek patches on either side and smaller females. 
So here's another picture. It shows us a little baby orangutan, sort of a juvenile orangutan, and then a mother with an infant. So again, these guys are going to spend the vast majority of their days up in the trees. Uh, they have really, really sort of flexible joints in both their shoulders and their hips. So that allows them, these guys are too big to brachiate. They cannot swing through the trees. Um, they really have to be holding on with at least two limbs at all time to keep themselves sort of in those branches. So their shoulder and hip joints are super flexible so that they can use them to rotate and reach to that next branch they need to to move. So really, really flexible hips and shoulders. Um, and again, what you're gonna typically see in terms of a social pattern is usually the males by themselves, the females either alone or with an offspring. Um, so that's why we do call them solitary, but we'll get a little bit deeper into that when we talk about social behavior because they are a little unique when it comes to that. Um, so yeah, these guys, again, are pretty endangered. They have been hunted for the pet trade pretty significantly. Um, and the only way to get a pet is to take it as an infant. The only way to get the infant is to kill the mom. Um, and the other problem is both on the island of Borneo and Sumatra, so there's been a lot of clear cutting of the rainforest to grow um, palm oil and to grow coffee. So that's something to consider when you guys are out grocery shopping. Next, we have our gorillas. So we do have gorillas at the Buffalo Zoo if you guys want to take a look at them. Um, so you'll see here a mother with her infant um, and she's eating some bamboo. That's the main part of these guys' diet, bamboo, shoots, leaves. Um, they are not an aggressive species. Um, I know we like to see movies or shows depicting them as being really aggressive and pounding their chests and running around. They are not typically like that because their diet is very low in nutrients. They're eating a lot of leaves and sticks and twigs and shoots and bamboo. So they spend the vast majority of their days like cows, just, they're just chewing on those veggies. So you can see um, our female there next to her is a picture of a silverback gorilla. So he's obviously a male and he is the breeding male in his group. You can tell because his back is silver. So social structure, we typically have a group with one breeding male and multiple females. Usually the females are not related. Um, so they... The male has his breeding group for life, if you will, unless some of his females are stolen away. So once he becomes the breeding male, his back hair does turn silver. So typically you'll have the silver back, who's the breeding male of the group, several of, of the females, and potentially a few of his adult male children. The males will be called black backs. Um, they will be repressing their um, sexual reproduction as long as they stay here in this group with their father, okay? So you will never have more than one silverback in a group. Um, the blackbacks will eventually leave and try to coerce or, off, or sometimes steal females away to create their own group. Um, but again, only one silverback to a group because that signifies that he is the breeding male. And we do have two subspecies of gorillas. We have our lowland and mountain gorilla. So this guy on the left, the very fuzzy guy here, he's a mountain gorilla. He needs to be fuzzy because he's at a higher altitude and it's much colder where he is. And then our lowland again is going to be in the lowland. So his fur is not nearly as fluffy or robust. Next we have our chimpanzees. So chimpanzees are a primate that we think we know a lot about. We see lots of them on TV. Um, this here is a juvenile. So if you ever see um, a, a chimpanzee with a pale face there, which is what you'll typically see when you're looking at a chimpanzee who's being used for TV or film, they are a juvenile. They're pr pr still pretty young. So this guy is up here in the trees. Chimpanzees spend a lot of time both in the trees and on the ground. Um, I didn't mention this with gorillas, but they're pretty much terrestrial. They don't go up in the trees. Um, they spend the vast majority of their time on the ground where chimpanzees will spend sort of an equal amount of time in the trees and on the ground. Chimpanzees will build nests in trees at night for sleeping and that helps to keep them away from predators. Um, but again, they'll forage and spend time grooming and socializing on the ground as well.
So here's another little picture of one of our juvenile chimpanzees. So you can see here, um, see how he's got his one hand on the ground um, and he's sort of got his knuckles there? That's called knuckle walking. Um, our gorillas will do this too. So when they're moving about on the ground, they're gonna walk on their back feet. So their back feet are gonna be planted flat, but their front, when they put their hands down on the ground, they're actually gonna walk on the tips of their knuckles. You can see his thumb there, his elongated palm, which will still help him climb trees, right? Because he's still going to spend some time up in the trees, eating fruit, um, hunting for um, little colobus monkeys. So again, these guys here are genetically very similar to humans, um, and they're going to spend a lot of time um, in, in maturity. So just like our spider monkeys, they do form those fission fusion societies. Males are going to be dominant. They're going to stay in their natal group. They're going to be large social groups that will split into smaller subgroups to forage throughout the day, come back together for grooming, and separate for foraging. And this here is our bonobo or uh, bonobo. So you can tell by looking at them that if you've ever seen pictures of um, early, early humans drawn sort of, you know, artist rendering, not far off from a bonobo. Um, they are genetically like 98.9, I think something like that. Their genetics or their DNA is similar to humans. Um, so you can see they do bear a striking resemblance to early humans or early hominids. They are a really sort of peaceful and tranquil chimpan or, um, primate. So our common chimpanzee or our chimpanzee can be quite agitated, volatile. Um, these guys usually live pretty docilely in their social groups. The big difference is that they do have a female dominant society. Um, and they, there's not many of these guys left in the wild. They do live in a very sort of, um, limited geographic region. So again, these guys are going to have a lot of physical or morphological similarities to the common chimpanzee. But again, they're, they are different. They are a different species. This is the bonobo. And then finally, we have our humans, the most prolific of all primates. Um, this little baby here, I don't know who it is. I just got a picture of a baby and put it in there. So you guys know a lot about humans. Again, when we move forward in this course, we start talking more about behavior. We're going to be really drawing parallels between human and non-human primates. But again, don't forget that when we're talking about our taxonomy exam and we're talking about um, hominoid species or hominoidae, humans and the great apes are all part of that. So remember that as you're answering those questions on the taxonomy exam. So to wrap up our taxonomy section, let's do a little bit of a recap. So with primates, there's lots of morphological variation, size, color, dentition, lots of variation in social groups and structures, many males and many females in a group versus monogamous pairs, etc. Lots of variance in social activities, solitary eye eyes, highly gregarious capuchins or circopithecines, lots of variation in locomotion. Remember, locomotion is how they move. Lots of variants in diet. So we have some that eat insects, some that eat gum, some that eat or gum or sap, some that eat leaves, some that eat fruit. So again, lots of variants in what they eat. Lots of variants in susceptibility to predation. Large versus small. A gorilla is not going to have a lot of predators versus a tiny mouse lemur. Okay. So what accounts for all of this variance? Why, why is there so many variants, so much variance? Well, that's the job of the primate behavioral ecologist. So moving forward, now that we're out of the taxonomy section, we are going to become a group of primate behavioral ecologists, right? We're going to, primatologists, we're going to figure out why the relationships between, what the relationship is between ecology, morphology, behavior, and sociality. So how does the ecology, where they live, affect their morphology, their physical characteristics? How do those affect their behavior? And how do those affect how they interact socially? So all of those things are tied together. Okay. 
And this includes social variables, dominance and subordinates, fighting, mating, genetic relatedness, ecological variables, so seasonal foods, present, pre, ugh, the presence of predators, and morphological variables like a long gut, right? We know that those colobus monkeys have a very long ruminant gut. So these are all going to be things that are going to be tied back together. None of them exist without the other. So that's why we need a great base of taxonomy of morphological, physical characteristics before we jump into any of the other things that are, I think, a little bit more interesting. Some examples of things that we're going to be talking about moving forward. We have colobus, which are old world monkeys, and howler monkeys are new world monkeys. Both of them eat leaves, but they have very different energy levels. Why? What does that have to do with the ecology and their morphology? Male gorillas have proportionately larger teeth than females, even though they eat leaves and not meat. Why? <laughs> when newly joining a group, male langurs will selectively kill most or all the infants who are still nursing and then immediately mate with the mothers, well, those who will agree to it. So why? Why do they do this? Why do are all of these different things happening? Why are these different um, tools used for different primates? So again, Taxonomy is just one section of what we're going to be doing. Understanding what the primate's physical characteristics are are important. And we're going to start talking about how those relate to their ecology and their behavior and their social grouping. So, you guys, that ends the section of taxonomy. If you haven't already started looking at those taxonomy exam questions, please do so. That exam is a bit of a challenge. Okay, so it's not necessarily that it's meant to be hard, but it does require some research because I spend a brief time on taxonomy. What I really want you guys to learn in the taxonomy section is how to find the answers, not to memorize things. Because let's be honest, do you guys need to memorize all of the different Latin names for these animals? It's not necessary. What you need to be able to do is utilize tools like your book, your taxonomy chart, to find the answers for things you need. I've been doing this for a very long time, and I still refer to that taxonomy chart pretty regularly because I just am not going to waste the brain energy to try to memorize everything on that chart. So again, make sure you've started that taxonomy exam. If you have questions on it, please reach out. And don't hesitate to use Google. Make sure your Google answer is correct, meaning that you're using an actual real source and not some weird random blog, <laughs> but a real article or a real um, text that is scientific, but don't hesitate to use that, okay? Everything is open and available for you for the taxonomy exam. All right, it's been a pleasure, and I will see you guys after the exam.